Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe's Classic Video Games back with another cool arcade game repair video for you this evening. We have been working on some games that a gentleman brought us, and one of them is this beautiful, wonderful, fantastic Atari Championship Sprint. This is a cool game. You may remember it from back in the day. I used to play this, I think, at the flea market. This is one of Joey's favorites. He loves it. Uh, this is a particularly good-looking one. It looks like someone has maybe repainted the cabinet because it looks too clean. It looks too clean to be the original paint. And then they put this sweet side art back on it. Um, looks very cool. So the cabinet is in very nice shape. Control panel looks like it has the original overlay, which is pretty nice as well. The steering wheels are great. Let me show you something on that. Um, this thing breaks all the time. So I don't know if those are new ones or if it's just the original ones, but look how you can wobble it a little bit. That's about how it's supposed to be. We figured that all out when we were working on those um, 3D printed reproductions that we got. They don't fit super tight. They're not supposed to. So there'll be a little bit of play in them. Okay. Um, it looks, looks very good. Very nice looking machine. Now, Championship Sprint, of course, had the two pedals down on the bottom. Someone has swapped out one of the coin door buttons just to give it a little character. And then this side looks equally as nice. How cool is that? This is the same cabinet that Paperboy was in. You don't see Paperboys often. We had one of these that somebody bought from us with the sole plan of taking the game uh, championship sprint out of it and making it a paper boy pretty crazy gets real expensive real quick um still has the original back door and it has a couple of or one or two screws holding it in. Okay, so let's look inside of it before we plug it up. I don't even know what's wrong with it. Um, so let me get a screwdriver. We'll take the back door off and uh, see if we can figure out what the problem is or what the guy claims is the issue. I didn't, I wasn't here when he dropped them off. Joey got them. He always keeps notes for me. He'll like, you know, write down. I, I, I've been trying to get him to get better at it, but in general, he'll he'll leave me a little list of like what's wrong with the with the machine, and then I come in later and try to figure it out and work on it a little bit. Now, when they made these, they have a lock on them, but in shipping, sometimes the door will come open. So most of the time, they actually had screws in them too. So although this looks like somebody's, you know, half butt did it, that's actually how they were made usually. I don't know for sure that these did, but there's a screw there and there's another one there. Um, only one of them was installed though. Let's see if I can get this apart. They're trying to call me folks Just when we're getting to the good thing and I still couldn't find Joey's list He said he was gonna start leaving me one okay, Again Come on. I want a full list where it shows everything this this doesn't cut it just because it's on the t-shirt He thinks it's so cute the funniest thing that he ever did. Oh, yeah, look, I had a t-shirt made that said it's broke. Oh, my. Look, I know all of y'all keep encouraging him, too. I've seen the comments. Okay, so this thing looks largely original. Who knows what's broke on it? Whatever that means. Um, so you've got a transformer down there and a fan. You've got some fuses. You've got a line filter, and then all that runs to a switching power supply. I don't know if originally it had a switching power supply. Because, um, yeah, I doubt it did. And let me show you why I think that. Maybe it did. I don't know. But there's one there, and then there's another one up here. I can't remember. I thought these had, like, the one of the Atari power supplies. But we'll figure all that out, all right? Don't worry about it. Um... What does it say here? One, blah, 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 buttons maybe, two blank, one red, two red, 
whatever. Uh, see. This is an interesting thing with the way they designed this cabinet. Can you tell what that's for? Why is there a black board mounted in there? That's the board that you put on the front of the machine if you remove the pedals because it's no longer a championship sprint. This was a kit cabinet, but it was uh, specifically for Atari System... Is it 2? System 2 games? Let's see, does it tell me here? Championship sprint, championship sprint... Atari System 1 or System 2, whichever one it was. I guess it's System 1. Uh, but you, So you could change out the games, like you could make it Paperboy. And so if you had Paperboy, you don't need the pedals down on the bottom. So you would remove them and then put that board back on the front to make the front of the cabinet look complete. It's a very cool system. Yeah, I think this... I always get it confused, which one's System 1 and which one's System 2. 1986, and this is medium resolution. This would be System 2, actually. Because the earlier ones were like Roadrunner, I mean, not Road, yeah, Roadrunner and uh, Marble Madness and uh, Road Blasters. Uh, oh, it tells us. System 2. Of course, you already knew that because you probably saw it on the title that I typed in later. All right, so this is the game board. Yeah, that's right. All of that is a game board. Look at that. Isn't it amazing? Look at it in all of its glory. Good old Atari over-designed stuff. Look at that. Okay, I'm going to keep showing it to you. Look at this. Do you understand that's like three and a half feet of PCB? Do you get me? The whole freaking back door is covered in a printed circuit board. Look at that. What an incredible accomplishment. <laughs> so, this is the video board, and this is the CPU board. Um, ROMs, RAM, I think that's a speech chip, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I believe that's a speech chip. Atari custom chip. Atari custom chip and a 6502 processor. So cool. Here's another one. Atari custom chip. ROMs and ROMs. Okay, and then you have the video board. ROMs. More ROMs. And then EPROMs. A lot of stuff going on here. Are these RAM, maybe? No, these are RAM. No, they're not either. Those are buffers. Where are our RAM? I need to see some RAM. There ought to be a lot of RAM somewhere to make this stuff work. Just tell me if you get bored with this. For those of you who just said you're bored with it, just fast forward. You'll be all right. The rest of us are going to look at some stuff. Check this out. This is another Atari prom. Where is our video RAM? Hmm. You would think there'd be like huge banks of video RAM. I haven't worked on one of these in quite a while. Now you may think, how does this guy not know if it's System 1 or System 2? 
It's because it doesn't really matter. A lot of people know all that stuff, but it's, you know, not to insult anybody. It's kind of useless information. You know, working on it is, is more important. You can figure it out as you go. So whatever's wrong with this board isn't going to be because it's a System 2 made in 1988 or a System 1 made in 1983 and it was the first time that blah, blah, blah. That has nothing to do with what's wrong with the board. Like, it, you're much better to have just a general knowledge of how this kind of stuff works and then you can fix or at least have a better shot at fixing anything you run into. I found a couple RAM. I'm just you just looking at it, trying to show everybody how it looks. I think it's cool. Some of y'all probably do too. It's just a beautiful design. Check it out. So we've got all these. Am I correct? See, yeah, those are all RAM too, aren't they? Yep. Those are all some kind of RAM as well. D446C3. They're going to be on the old stuff that would have been 2016s, but it's probably too new for that. Yeah, so those aren't proms, those are RAM. That explains it. Now, so you might say, well, how do you know those are RAM? It's because they're all the same part number. If they were a prom, they would have a different part number because there's something burned on them. Now, if you know what they are, you're going, well, of course they're RAM. It's a D44 6 that's a US RAM. But, again, <laughs> you can figure it out, too, if you just work with enough of them. You can say, oh, okay. Now, these, see how they look similar? 9128-15, that's definitely RAM as well. So, the dash 15 is going to be the speed. So, yeah, those are not PROMs either. Yeah, so a couple proms, but mainly EPROMs. That one that we saw, uh, somebody's repaired it at some point. That one that we saw with the Atari logo on it is just a standard thing that Atari did. It would just have this little tiny chip. Um, I don't know why they do it like that, but they did. Midway did a bunch of stuff like that too. So see the Atari logo inked on it? So that is... Literally, they call that a PROM, Programmable Read-Only Memory. Um, look, at the, look at the solder joint from the factory there. You like that one? How do you like that solder joint there? You cool with that? That's a good one, ain't it? Um, so yeah, that's a little PROM that they would just use in certain sections. It's basically instructions for that section, I guess. Alright, so RAM, RAM... ROMs, a little bit of RAM here, RAM, ROMs, custom chips, oh, it says uh, CPU, custom chips, speech chip, ROMs, some RAM. So, very cool. Alright, so I would assume, <laughs> you know what that means, that the problem on this is going to be how dirty all these chips are. They all look pretty r dusty. Uh, if one pin on one of these chips isn't making a good connection in its socket, the game is not going to work right, as intended, right? So that would be my first guess if there's a problem. My second guess would be that a similar issue is causing one of these two power supplies not to send the correct amount of voltage to the two boards. That one's hooked to this board. That one's hooked to this board. Now another issue that pops up, I, I think on the original there was a a larger power supply on the bottom for just one board and then the the switching power supply for the other board something like that there's also an issue where sometimes the two boards have a different um, voltage going to them so like maybe that one's putting out 4.9 and that one's putting out 5.2 so since the two boards are working at a different level it causes issues so we got to look into that as well moving on from there the other uh, interesting thing about this cabinet is this this is a Wells Garner K4900 monitor that is a medium resolution. Usually you see them, they're standard resolutions, but this is a medium res, which was famous in this series of games. Paperboy needs it, Championship Sprint needs it, 
and I don't even remember what the other System 2 titles were. I guess there's a couple more, but you never see them. Um, so there's some extra accessories here because this is a medium res chassis instead of a standard res. Usually it doesn't have quite this much junk on it. So uh, that may be a problem. The good news is the K4900 monitor series is one of the absolute most reliable monitors. Now, of course, it won't work now that I've said that, but usually it can be fixed. Now, of course, we won't be able to fix it now that I've said that, but you get my point, okay? Don't get me started, people. Come on. Well, you always get me started, and I was just trying to be friendly. And All right, so I plugged it in. Now, unlike when we bring up a vector game or something like that or even a pinball sometimes, uh, on this one, you can kind of just plug it in and go for it and see what happens. Um, you don't have a ton of danger here. Um, because typically, unless somebody's just being being a complete jackass, typically these power supplies aren't going to put out too much voltage where it's going to fry anything, right? And then the raster monitor, it's kind of a raster monitor. You need to turn it on and see if it works. So we're going to see what happens. Uh, one thing I would be interested in seeing is if we've got a power light on both of the power supplies. So here we go. Are you ready? Power light. Power light. Power light. Power light. Now, that don't mean a damn thing, but at least it's trying to get some power. And I heard the monitor come up. If you look, there is neck glow, baby. See it? You see it. All right, let's see if the game booted. Now, notice I didn't go around to the front. All the fire will happen back here, people. You don't need to be in the front yet. Nothing. Nothing. Or are there? All right, so on second look, the monitor is on and displaying a green box. So why green? It's because they just got the monitor misadjusted. Why is there no video on there? Well, that's a good question. Um, but the monitor itself looks to be working. You can have an issue where the monitor comes on but doesn't display video, but that's very rare in an arcade game because that circuit is so simple. So if the game board is putting out video and the monitor is coming on, which it is, you can see it's creating an image, uh, for the monitor to not pass the video signal through itself to the screen is very rare. I mean, one out of a hundred failures on a, mon on a monitor would be that, right? Um, so basically, our game board, although getting power, either hasn't booted or it doesn't have enough power or the video output circuit three screwed up or the RAMs are screwed up or something, something, or the other. Um, so the next step is to check the voltage on the boards and see what kind of voltage they're trying to run at. Like a typical Atari game, they have little blades that you can check the, the voltage on. So see how this says ground, for instance. So there's one down there that says ground and one says five. So if I check it here on my meter that Todd gave us, thank you, Todd, it's 4.7 volts. Typically, a game's not going to run on 4.7 volts. It's just a little too low. If it's 4.89, 4.88, it would probably boot up. But 4.7, it's not going to do it. And check. notice that I checked on the board. So that, that's, a, that's something that whenever you start out, it's, it's, uh, it's real easy to screw that up. It doesn't necessarily matter if you've got 5 volts down there if you've only got 4.7 here. What's important is the voltage that the board actually sees because that's what it's for. So the, the, the chips need 5 volts. And there's an adjustment on the power supply just to make sure that that happens. So let's carefully check the voltage on the top board. Uh, let me find a good ground here. And I don't want to use the ground on the bottom board. I want to use stuff for the top board. Does that say GND? No, it says connector 2, I think. So we need a good ground. They kind of blend in. I see the 5 up there.
Let's see if we can check it across that cap and just forego the, the cute little... blades. Okay. 5.07. That's what you want. Not 5.1. Not 4.8. Not 4.7. You want 5.074. That's about perfect. Now you might be saying, well, how come it's not 5.000? Well, because that's, it's five points, it's five volts up here, 5.07 or so up here, which is right where the power comes in. Once you get down to here, this chip may only be getting 5.00, right? So you want it just a little bit high, but not crazy high. So between 5 and 5.1 is a good, good little spot. Okay, so you got a situation where the CPU board has 5 volts on it, as tested on the lug, but the video board has 4.7 on it, which isn't enough to, to boot the video, okay? So here's what I want to go look up. Does this board's 5 volts, which is correct, connect in any way through this connector to this board's 5 volts? Probably not, or they would both be the same voltage, right? So if they're not passing the 5 volts that this board uses through this connector to this board, then you end up with this situation where one board, the, vol the voltage is lower than the other. Now you'll notice that there are ground screws that connect the ground of this board to this plate which then connects the ground of this board to the same plate. So the grounds are tied together, right? But this board has enough voltage to run it. This board, in my opinion, is a little low. So we could probably fix it. That would be my theory by turning up that power supply a little bit. At least that's what we're going to check. But since we're testing it and this one's a little bit high and this one's definitely low, I'm going to check this connector, which is the only way this board connects to this one, and just confirm that the voltages aren't tied together as it appears. All right, folks, so here is that connector on the CPU board. It's labeled P18, and the, the other board, the video board, plugs into it like a big socket. The System 1 stuff worked like that, too, but the board layout was a lot different. Um, but you can see that a bunch of the connections aren't even used. They're just grounded. Okay, so about half of them don't do anything. And then you have all these other ones here, which... It says, uh, I think it gave me a name for it somewhere. CPU video, CPU to video buffers, basically. Right? So, you can see the signals there coming out of an LS244, another one, another one, a 245, and then 245, okay? Now, there is one connection. Pin number two does have five volts on it, but it doesn't catch it like it doesn't do anything with it I think they just designed it like that just in case they uh, just hmm that's interesting this standalone thing uh, I guess they just designed it like that so that they could uh, change it if they needed to if they needed voltage on that connector they could do it but basically each board has its own power supply and they are not connected in any way so that's how you get one board is at one voltage and one board is at the other but with it like that it's not going to work all right, so cleaning the connections doesn't change it. If I wiggle the connector, it doesn't change it. There is another connector here. I removed, sprayed some uh, cleaner in. That doesn't change it. So we're left with our option is just turn up the power spot. So let's see if we can get it to do it live. <laughs> Wrong way. Five point zero five, and then we'll turn it off because we want it to boot up um, at the same time that the CPU board is booting up, right? So let's see if it, when it boots, it is similar. Five point zero five. That's similar to the five point zero seven up here. Let's see if that changed anything. I think typically on these you hear like a some kind of really cool futuristic sounding boot up if it does boot up it goes boom or something like that uh, nothing that was a big waste we should have just left it how it was all right so we know that our voltages are at least decent 
this particular type of game, I believe, takes a while to boot, but I'm seeing nothing on the screen. It's the same green box that we had. All right, so next I would, you, you can use a logic probe and start working through things, but I think we probably need to clean some chips. We've got so many of them that are filthy. Maybe we pull out a couple, starting with the CPU, and just see how things look. All right, folks, we're going to have to get deep in it. So I went through and I cleaned some of the chips on the CPU board, but whenever you've got like nothing on the screen, that means nothing is going on. You know what I mean? It's like the whole thing's dead. A lot of times on at least the older boards like Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, even if like the, the, uh, the program's not running, you'll still get garbage and trash on the screen. This has nothing on the screen, so that's kind of unique. And so I'm looking through the schematics, just trying to figure out how it works. And this thing's fairly complex. There's a 6502. We saw that a minute ago. That actually handles the audio and some of the switches and things like that. And then there is a T11 microprocessor. I've never even heard of that. I thought the T11 was like the 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 uh, cop in Terminator 2, but um, maybe that was the T2. I don't remember. It's been a long time. So... This T11, I mean, we have no clue if the board's doing anything. So we don't know if it's sending the signal to the video board and then the video board is dead or what, right? So uh, we're going to check that out. So this T11 we're going to check first. Now, it should have its 5 volts because that's just wired through the board. And then the first thing we're going to check is this clock signal. So there is a, it needs a signal at pin 22 on the T11 to run the board. And if you follow that back, it comes back here uh, to a flip-flop, comes back here to a flip-flop, and then there is a crystal here. So it's 20 megahertz, and then it gets over here, it flips and flops, and now it's 10 megahertz. It gets over here, runs through this. Highly likely it's five megahertz by the time it gets here. Um, and then it runs through this, blah, 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 right? So we're going to just see if we have any kind of signal at pin 22 of that T11 chip while the board is turned on. Well, I had no choice, folks. I had to check it. Since it's such a high frequency, that little logic probe wasn't cutting it. So I hooked up the scope to it. And it is a 10 megahertz clock signal. So the, it's a good example of how the logic probe will fail you sometimes. Um... So it does have the clock signal into that T11 chip. Again, though, I've never even heard of a T11 chip, so I don't know what else it needs to turn on and run and all of that. So the next thing I would check is some of the outputs to see if we've got signals on the outputs. All right, so the whole thing runs on 5 volts. You've got some address lines here, but just a couple or just a few are hooked up. The crystal, the other one's grounded. You've got a reset line. Uh, the ready, uh, I guess that's what ready that means. It looks like it's connected to the voltage through a resistor. You have two grounds. You have a B, not B clear <laughs> signal. C out, select zero, select one. C A S R A S, not R A S, not C A S. Uh, read and WLWH, and then you've got all these data lines. So I'm going to check the data lines and see if we have dancing on those. So one through nine, you skip eight because eight is a ground, and then 10 through 17. So we're just going to see if any of those have action on them. All right, so if you look at pins one through eight or one through seven whatever it was they are dead as a door now now see how that one's high that doesn't mean anything that's just what's going on with them they're not bouncing right so pin 19 is the reset signal and it's stuck high but you have to test it when you reset it So a reset signal should start out momentarily low and then go high. 
Aha! I got you, you sucker! We'll try it one more time. Uh-huh. All right. So I think the reset signal screwed up. That would explain why we're not hearing any sound or anything else, because they all use the reset signal. So here's the reset line. I suppose it's active high, but I don't know. Maybe it's active low. It's not active low, or it would, I guess it would show a little circle there. All right, so that's supposed to go high. Hmm. But you know what? It's the reset line. So if it... See, I don't know the T11 stuff. It's some rare chip, a DEC T11, which uh, wasn't used in all that much stuff. So I don't know if that needs to go high or go low. Let me see if I can figure it out. All right, so that wasn't too hard to figure out. I just looked at the T11 user manual, and I'm at, like, page 50, which is page 13 of section 3. It's not that big of a deal. It was just, like, you know, 50 pages of reading. When voltage is applied, the power up changes state from low to high. So we got that. The BCLR output is asserted. Power up changes state from high to low. The mode register is loaded. The BC clear output is cleared. 20 refresh transactions and 10 refresh transactions or blah, 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 occur. The stock pointer is loaded to 3768 something. The program counter is loaded to the start address and the processor status word is loaded to 340 and ASPI transaction occurs. Okay, so in other words, we're supposed to go low to high, but that could be off to high. And then it should go back from high to low. We're sticking on high. So we've got some kind of reset uh, problem. Uh, I don't know if that's how, they're, how they do the watchdog or not. Um, but that is our problem. So that would explain why nothing's happening. So now we got to see on the board where that signal comes from and try to track it down. All right, so if we move through the schematics, there is an area called Reset and Watchdog Clear. Now, I will say one thing about Atari, they had very extensive schematics, so they show you every little thing, which is good. Reset and Watchdog Clear. I remember something about messing with this section before on another game. It may have even been the last championship sprint we had, um, and I think I did a video of it. So I've probably got a video already about this exact thing, but... Um, if you look, here is the reset line that we that is just always high. And this is a flip-flop, so it ain't flipping and flopping, folks. So there's not reset, and that's not reset. And then you've got watchdog disable. So I don't know if... I don't know what the watchdog disable would do. So I don't know if this is... That line just staying high may be how it does its watchdog, but usually on other systems that I've worked on, like Z80 and 6502s, the, if the watchdog is screwed up, it'll go back and forth, so it'll be blinking. So that line, that reset line, would be high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low, very quickly as it resets over and over again. This one isn't, it's just stuck, leading me to believe that it actually may be something in the actual watchdog circuit. So if you back, keep going back to follow the signal, it goes through these LS... Uh, 393s, I guess. Uh, and then goes back up to here. And this is the part that I remember, this little chip. So here's, here's the situation. The signal that does all of the reset comes through here. And at one point, there is a Zener diode tied to 5 volts, I guess. Or is that 15 volts? Something. I think that's these freaking schematics. I guess that's 5 volts. And that one's 15. So 15 and negative 15 on this LM324. LM324s are known to go bad. You look at them wrong and they go bad. Also, Zener diodes are known to go bad. So that could be bad or those could be bad. Look, here's another one. Okay. But then if you go back even farther, the original signal comes from a line called power okay. So we gotta go find that. 
So if you look in the power supply section of this board, not the whole board, not I mean not the power board, just this board, the power OK signal is just a, I guess that would make it a filter, whatever, a line that comes from an edge connector on the board that says power OK. Now this is a typo, so I don't know what I'm doing, but I already found a typo. That says J20 pin 4, but if you look over here, it says that the round connector is J15. So they're using the round thing, but it says J20. Everywhere else it says J15. Um, so I think that's p pin 4 on J15. So now we got to go find that. So you go back farther in the schematics and you find the connector for the uh, CPU board, which is a big old... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you know, 17 pin connector. And if you look, pin 4 does say power on. So, yeah, I think that was a typo. So, J15 power on. So, that is that gray wire. I know this is very hard to follow. Pin 4, this gray wire, if you follow it down, it connects to this wire. Well, if you, if you follow it back up, is the plus 15 volt DC. Now why in the world they did that? I guess just so that they can use a different setup externally if they want. Why not just tie, tie power okay to 15 volts DC on the actual board? I don't know. But the plus 15 volts DC apparently is the power okay signal. So first thing we need to do is see if we've got positive 15 and negative 15 volts DC and if the power okay positive 15 volts DC signal is there. Whew, that's a mouthful. So here is the voltages coming in from the power supply, but that is a um, switching power supply. It has plus 5, negative 5, and plus 12. Um, it looks like they're only using the plus 5 in the ground off of it. So apparently these wires our, ace, our wires coming in from the very bottom. Um, and look at this. Something's disconnected. Maybe that went there originally. See, uh, like I said, I didn't think this was completely right. but um, So pin 4 is the power OK wire, which is supposed to be gray. And at some point it connects to pin 2, which is also the same color. And these are these going down. They go past this board and they run down into the cabinet somewhere. Now, there is also an audio board in the front that's like an amplifier and has the volume knob and the, the power switch. So it could be maybe it runs there. Um, or it could... Yeah, it must run up there. They must be creating 15 and negative 15. All right, so this is the audio PCB. It's the one in the front, and it, is, it does convert AC voltage to DC voltage. The positive 15 that's supposed to be on the board is positive 4.7 or something like that. And the negative 15 that's supposed to be on the board is not there. And those are used in the audio, and they're also used in the uh, reset circuit. So without those, the board will never work. So we're figuring it out. But, you know, Joey, if he would have put one more line, like if he would have not just put it's broke, if he would have said power supply, power supply, power supply, I probably would have already figured it out. But, you know, I can't get him to do it. He just won't do it, people. All right. So if you look at that line we were just looking at, the power OK line, it ties it as plus 15, and then it also ties to this plus 15, right? And I was getting plus, well, I wasn't even checking that yet. Well, yeah, I was. I was getting, I was getting plus 4.7 or something like that on that line. So all three of those tie together right here. 
and they come down and they come down from the plus regu plus regulated I guess that would be called positive regulated this gray wire so that's where the plus 15 comes from now if you look there is a plus 14 and a minus 14 it's just there's all kinds of stuff right by this time Atari was just showing themselves <laughs> They'd been doing it a long time at a high level. Okay, so the plus REG signal comes from right there. The way it's made is on that audio board in the front through this signal, 17 volt AC. So this is the one I wasn't getting 15, I was getting plus 4.7 or something like that, right? So, I go to check these voltages, and I started at the transformer. So, I'm testing the voltage, and they're just fine on this side of the fuse, and they're just fine on this side of the fuse. And then I go around to the front of the game, and it's up and running. The whole freaking problem was this fuse the connector that holds it here and here was super loose. Now, I, when I checked on the board, I also didn't have the negative 15. It was zero, so I, probably one of these fuses was doing the same thing. So I took all three fuses out, cleaned them, tightened up the fuse holders, put them back. And we are up. Very cool. So... Just goes to show you, check the voltages on the power supply. Now, isn't that the first thing I said? The very first thing I said at the beginning of the video. And I didn't even check all the voltages. Mm, mm, mm. So that would have sped it up a little bit. But hey, this is a video, folks. So, you know, sometimes in the videos, you want to make them long-winded so everybody sees as much as possible about how to fix the game. I adjusted the monitor a little bit. I turned the green slightly down. Turned the blue up and the red up. And uh, it looks pretty good, I think. So, I think what we'll do is we'll test play it. But I'm not going to test play it myself. I'm going to have Joe do it because this is one of his favorite games and he loves playing it. That'll also give us the opportunity to test and make sure that the thing is still up and running tomorrow. So, if it's still up and running tomorrow, Joey will film you a little gameplay video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Power supply, power supply, power supply. I told them. I'm always telling you guys, power supply, power supply, power supply. But anyway, I'm going to try it out. I like Championship Sprint. It's one of my favorite games. I don't get to play it that often because I don't have one, and I never, hardly ever get them in for repair. But I used to play this all the time at the flea market growing up I'd always go to the flea market every weekend Saturday and Sunday and they had one of these out in the uh, little lobby area the restaurant area and I played it all the time I'm not saying I'm any good at it but I did play it and I like this a lot better than paperboy people are always taking these poor championship sprints and they're kitting them in the paperboy because everybody likes paperboy better but I think Championship Sprint is a much funner game. But here we go. I'm going to be the red side. I'm always the red. Because I'm right handed. I don't know if that's... I don't know. I just feel better on the right side. I always start off on this track here. I just love to spin that steering wheel pretty much as hard as you could to get around the corners.
right there. You pretty much just spin it all the way around. That wasn't a good example, but you'll see next time. cut through there in the middle you could do but I never do it on that one this one's pretty tough Locked ran out on this one, bro. Come on, one. Let's go. I think they unlapped me. at me down there working on my car try it again See that?
think I was gonna get that one. My gas pedal messed up. It's rigged. Oh, come on. I got a defective machine. Well, I might have to mess with that gas, gas pad a little bit, but as you can see, it was working pretty good till that happened. I mean, I probably would have set the world record if the gas pedal would have kept working. All right. Got the pedal fixed. The little set screw came loose. Apparently, I'm aggressive when I play championship sprint. This may be the last one of these you see because everybody keeps buying these cabinets and turning them into paper boy. But I'm just going to go ahead and say it. You guys might not like it. I'm going to go ahead and say it. Paperboy sucks.